Um, and as always, we start with public comment. Do we have any comment from the public? Um, hey, Sharon. This, is, this is Sharon, and I'd just like to say thank you to um, Chris, who helped um, the mayor write testimony in favor of H3292 that had its hearing on Tuesday. And um, I'll keep you posted on whether something different happens on Rule 10 Day than has happened to any of the previous three sessions where <laughs> I've been working for bold climate legislation. And thank you for what you do. Thanks, Sharon. You're welcome. And thank you for keeping us informed. Any other public comments? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to move on. So, first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes of the last meeting. Is there a motion to adopt? Move to adopt. Okay. Second. Second, David, seconds. Any discussion, comments, changes? Okay, you all know the drill by now. We have to do roll call vote as part of being able to work remotely. Uh, Wayne, I vote yes. David? Uh, yes. Louie? Yes. Uh, Alex? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Uh, Ashley? Yes. Rich? Yes. And Ben? Yes. And I'm not missing Tim Stone out on the call, right? Yeah, okay. All right. So, um, then, so the next thing, let's put this up on the screen. Um, the next thing is sort of what we're doing now, each meeting in terms of sort of updating um, where we are on various items. Um, so this is just sort of a running list. So I'm only gonna go over, or Chris and I will only go over things which have changed. Um, so just the, the, the quick ones that are in process, the climate into the capital improvements program, that's in process. PVPC has given their penultimate report. So our little working group has to come back together to think about you know, next steps for capital improvements. Once the new mayor is on board, um, we're gonna debrief both the new mayor um, and the finance director, Charlene Nardi, um, to say what worked and what didn't work for what we did like. So that, that process is underway. Um, the district energy piece, this is specifically the city council order to ask Eversource to consider doing a, a uh, utility, a district heating utility. Um, basically, Heat, who's been our free consultant in this process, had a meeting with Eversource and did the initial introductions. We weren't there, just started saying Northampton's interested. They said, great, let's talk. And so um, Heat is gonna set up a meeting with Eversource. So we don't have a time for that. But that, that process goes forward. Um, we're sort of looking on parallel tracks. One is to the extent they're only doing one utility. I mean, one pilot is unlikely to be Northampton, though we're going to make the pitch. But more importantly, as they keep working in this space, we assume they're going to keep expanding and doing more pilots. So we just want to be in their face, as it were, going forward. Um, then the state legislation on fossil fuel buildings, I shan't. Sharon already talked about that, so you heard about that. And then the, the last three items we're gonna be talking about later in our agenda today. So I won't spend time with that right here in the process. So that's the quick updates on those past recommendations from the commission. Chris, do you have anything to add to any of those things? Wayne? Yeah. I just wanna mention that the uh, fossil fuel free letter actually was a, a separate letter um, and it was in the it was in the mail the handout package that went out so yeah you can see okay. the copy of it but that was a that was that was sort of thing and also um, Ashley had asked for some kind of a um, sorting mechanism for the their recommendation of list and so I added a status column for people if it doesn't you know if you go online you can you can sort something completed or ongoing etc it was my attempt to make it more manageable as it gets bigger. That's, That's it. Great. Hey, Chris, I don't know if it's a bad internet connection or your mic, but you're sort of, when you talk, you fade in and out. So if you can do anything, 
that would be great. If you can't, then you can't. Um, I think it's my internet connection. That's why my video is off. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. All right, so then we're gonna go back to our retreat. Um, just sort of some of the items that are on that from before. Um, and let me share the screen again. So the first is, you know, with the uh, mission statement is an iterative process. You know, you've seen it, you made comments, we made changes, you made more comments. So this is the current version that we have from the last comments that we have. You all got this in your package as well. Um, as you all know, I think, we don't make the final decision. We just make a recommendation to the mayor and assuming that the mayor elect wants to go forward, this goes on to city council to ask them to adopt it. But we wanna make sure that we as a group are all happy with that before we do that. So uh, open this up for comments in the mission statement. What are the changes do we need? It, it might be worth um, trying to break up the first sentence. Um, it's pretty loaded and hard, I think, hard to follow. Okay. Yes, it's long. <laughs> it is a very dense five line. <laughs> yes, no, you're absolutely right. <laughs> okay, I can do that. I think that's a pretty straightforward editorial thing. Yeah. Other comments? Yeah, Wayne, I just have a quick question. I think we covered this at our last meeting, but um, where it says, including minimizing service disruptions. Yep. So if I were to read, if I were just to read that and not read everything else, I would think that we work for National Grid. So I'm just curious as to, can someone just refresh my memory why we're keeping, we're minimizing service, why that's in there? So this came out of Ben's recommendation. So Ben, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, Ben, please refresh my memory. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I recall okay. it having to do with no, resilience. Wait, wait, I do. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Yeah, actually, when, when the um, mission statement was first written, it was during the time of peak oil. when everybody thought we were about to distinctly run out of oil. And, um, and that was a, a big piece of the Energy Commission when it was first formed. That was a broader way of saying loss of oil. It also takes into account resilience because if we are prone to big power outages and we can do something about that, then we should, or if, you know, basically, so yes, the resilience piece is what it is. Yeah, I don't want to put words in Ben's mouth because when he's here to contradict me, but I thought that latter point that Chris was saying was what he was trying to get, saying, you know, we expect more things like the October snowstorm and just more disruptions with bigger storm events. And yes, National Grid obviously owns a piece of day-to-day -day maintenance, but there may be bigger things. Is there a bigger need mm -hmm. for microgrids? Is there a bigger need for um, you know, distributed energy that maybe can better withstand changes? So I think it's those things. I mean, maybe since it's confusing, and I, I mean, I think Rich is right. It does sound like, oh, we're just trying to make sure that the electricity is always on. Uh, which we are, <laughs> right? We, we do want that. Um, but it's really, it, since, since it's really about resilience, um, I mean, I guess, is it necessary to have it in there at all, right? Resilience does include like not having things breaking. I, I'm totally fine. I, I don't think it's necessary to be there. I think it is included. I, I just, more for background, maybe the difference between us and National Grid is to me, this isn't only about delivery, it's also about backup systems. So how do we have passive survivability of buildings, for example, that can survive without you know, heat for a while? Or how do we have a community resilience hub where the places to go and there's interruptions? But all that said, I'm fine just dropping. David? Uh, just, you mentioned uh, backup generation way. I was, I was going to mention that, uh, the fact that we have resilience for uh, 
uh, basically equipment that's going to keep the lights burning, so to speak, whether it's a microgrid or backup generators. But to me, uh, minimizing service disruptions is also being able to get the fire department to the west side of Northampton mm -hmm. if the roads aren't flooded or being able to uh, keep bridges open so people can evacuate certain areas and go to shelters. So it's not it's more than just keeping the lights on in a particular building. OK, good point. Uh, Gordon. Well, I was just going to suggest that if we um, if we were to strike, including minimizing service disruptions and uh, just before that, after it says and climate resilience, where it says and climate resilience, if we just add uh, energy resilience, climate and energy resilience, uh, that might do the trick. Because we, I think that, um, you know, the need for us to get the fire department through the floods would be covered by climate resilience and the need for us to maintain a steady stream of uh, energy would be covered by energy resilience. Other thoughts? So I'm looking for the, the sense that, of the group. Are you all comfortable with drop minimizing service deliveries and adding in energy? Does that work for everyone? Seeing heads nodding. What if for we? Me. What? Excuse me. What if we? What if we minimizing critical service disruptions? Um, there was a lot of discussion about the. Uh, sewage treatment plant and the grocery stores and the gas stations when yeah. we were out mm -hmm. for like a week. Okay, maybe object to that. Okay, Chris, you raised your hand and disappeared. You, was that a thumbs up? Was that was a thumbs up. Okay. But I'll go with the group, yeah. All right, so any other changes people want to this? Sorry, I was a little confused by that last one. So I thought we were striking minimizing, including minimizing service disruptions and just adding climate and energy resilience. But Louis' suggestion was not, was Right, not, his was, suggestion is keep it and add critical to it. And add, okay. Yeah. You okay with that, Alex? Does that work? Um, yeah, I'm okay with it. I do like the idea of <clears throat> splitting up that first sentence. Okay. I think that will that will help it help it be easier to understand. All right. So uh, Gordon, are you raising your hand again? Oh yeah. Um, I'm curious about the state elected officials in the second line. Um, does anyone remember where that came from? Yeah, I that's think... that's. I mean, you've been increasingly, you know, and, and both Sharon and Adele have been leading this, but on your own, you've been doing this as well. You've been increasingly asking us to write letters of support for various resilience and sustainability measures to state elected officials. Um, so that that's the reason for that piece. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I can speak to that. I think I suggested that that our advocacy work be added, and uh, that that was one way to include that. Right, Wayne? Yes, correct. And and it's both state elected and appointed officials. So. DPU is appointed, obviously legislators are elected. All right, so at this point I'm hearing three changes. The first one is breaking up the first sentence into at least two sentences, if not three. Um, that's an easy editorial change. I don't feel like it needs to come back to you all, but I'm happy to. The second one is making it climate and energy resilience. And the third and final one is adding, making it minimizing critical service disruptions. I have one other. Yep. Um, I would suggest striking the word public in front of accountability. Um, it's not clear to me if we're holding the public accountable or if we're the, the, the public, the, the body representing the public. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's fine. Again, assuming no one objects. Any other ones? All right, so I have to do a little bit of editing. Again, I don't think that's gonna be substantive. Do you wanna see this in your January meeting before we submit it to the mayor for her consideration, the mayor-elect for her consideration? Or are you ready to go with it? 
sorry, one other thing. Are we are we an advisory body of the of the city or of the mayor? Like, do we of the city? Want... Well, that's the suggestion of the city. Okay, and that that's what that's what's in here right now. Got it. Okay. This is, I mean, an advisory is not is in some ways it's less about who it's of. It's more as opposed to a regulatory body or a final, you know, a financial body. So, um, so all the committees were sort of defined as. Regulatory makes the final decision. Advisory is advising somebody else. All right. So and then again, question: Do you want to come back to you all with a final clean version before we go to the mayor and mayor elect, or do you want to? Are you ready to go forward and introduce it? Well, Wayne, could you could you do the edits and actually send us an email with the yeah the new version, and then we can just respond to you directly. Okay. And then if uh, you find a consensus that uh, there needs to be other changes from individual commissioners, then we would we would bring it up at our next meeting, I guess. I think. Okay, would that works for me. All right, thank you. All right, so I'll send it out. I'll give you, you know, a week or two to respond. And if I don't hear, con you don't need to respond in positive. So if you're concerned, definitely do it. We, you know, we're not in any particular time schedule. Council is sort of in the organizational period in January. So not that much happens anyway until they're their subcommittees are set up, but if we can move forward, we will. So I will send that all to you. Um, and uh, I, we probably, because we're gonna make a recommendation to the mayor and council, it's probably worth with these changes, having a motion to endorse it. So I, instead of just the nodding your heads. So as amended, is someone willing to make a recommendation? We pass it on to the mayor. Moved. Ben? I'll second. 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 Okay. Rich got Rich it. second. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Alex. <laughs> Again, I'd do roll call vote. Uh, David? Yes. Louis? Yes. Alex? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Ashley? Yes. Rich? Yes. Ben? And yes. Wayne? Yes. Great. It's unanimous. Great. Thank you all very much. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I, I Put things on the screen and not. I think you all are, are know more about Zoom than you ever wanted to, but remember there is a bar between your pictures and the the screen. So if you ever don't want so much on the screen, you can just move the bar on your own if you want to see each other's faces. Um, so it's not fixed in time. Um, all right. So next to the agenda is the agenda format um, in the package Chris sent out. I think this is exactly as it came from Gordon. I'm not sure about that. Um, so let me just put that back it, up here. It, it hasn't yes, changed. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Chris, I just sent you over a revised clean copy. Um, I should have sent that to you as well, Wayne. Maybe Chris can pull it up on his screen. Did you get that, Chris? Um, I'd have to go dig into my email. Um, I could, hang on. In the meantime, by any chance, could you send it to Wayne as well, since he's already sh sharing his? Yeah, uh, why, don't, there you go. why don't I do that in just a moment? And then whoever gets there first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, while, while we wait for that. As I'm saying that because I know. Gordon, do you want to start walking us through? Does that make sense? So it came from you? Yeah, sure. And I'll put that up as soon as the email comes. Yeah, I just sent that over to you. So I've got a number of really good comments. I appreciate that. Um, one of the things that I did was add suggested time allotments uh, to each of the sections. So as soon as we get that uh, pulled up, you'll all be able to see that. Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to find my Zoom page again. There we go. Um, I did just kind of put in the proposal that the time allotments would be uh, at the discretion of the chair uh, with everyone's approval. Um, that way, when there are urgent matters that come up, the chair can decide uh, to allot more time to them to make sure that we're, we're uh, discussing uh, matters as much as needs to be. Um, I eliminated the second public comment period 
from it. And then I also clarified what I meant by department heads, which I, I believe I had kind of gotten wrong. Um, what I did was change that to saying the DPW, the building department, uh, and Smith Voke. And I hope I got everyone with those three uh, of the staff, people who are uh, in the meetings regularly. My hope was just that with that section that we could hear from those three departments as they're critical to sustainability um, and uh, get an idea as to what they're what they're working on uh, within their department. Um, oh, and then I also added in a section, I don't know how I forgot this. Uh, I added in a section for uh, city councilor commissioners to give a briefing as well uh, so that we could hear about uh, sustainability efforts as they relate to potential legislative action from city council. Um, so that's it. So I'll just walk through it real quick from, from the beginning. It would be announcements, uh, administrative briefing or administration briefing, uh, follow up from the previous meeting. Uh, so if there are uh, issues that are, are ongoing that we're working on addressing things that are assigned at the end of the previous meeting that would be addressed after the administrative briefing briefing pardon me um, the DPW building department and Smith Voke report uh, city councilor commissioner briefing appointed commissioner briefing uh, guest subject matter expert that we may or may not have in any given meeting but I think that it would be a great thing for us to start doing regularly. Um, when it comes to reliability, we're really going to need to start getting National Grid and our other service providers involved in these meetings. We need to start asking them some tough questions as to how they expect to be providing us enough electrons to support the conversion over to electric vehicles that we're about to experience. And we, at this point, as far as I can tell, um, National Grid is not prepared to support that effort uh, with our existing grid infrastructure. So we're gonna really need to start pulling in people from the outside into these meetings and, and starting to get our heads wrapped around uh, what they're going to be doing to help, help move us forward and make us more sustainable. Um, and then finally, uh, a, an assignment of responsibilities uh, based upon that meeting's discussion. Uh, we call them do outs uh, often. Um, so we're looking at uh, what do we need to get done before the next meeting, um, making sure that people understand what they need to do individually. Uh, and then um, that way, when we come back to the following meeting, we, we have stuff ready to go. So that, that's my proposal. Um, and I, I hope that uh, people would see it as an opportunity for us to, to uh, improve our, yeah. Great. Thanks, Alex. So uh, Alex first, then Rich, then Chris. Thanks, Gordon. Um, yeah, I love, I love these ideas. Thanks for incorporating some of my comments. Um, so I still have some confusion about administration briefing and then the DPW building department and Smith folk, because we also have you know, central services um, representative and we have planning department representative. Are those what you're seeing in administration briefing while the others are um, uh, separate? Okay, so you said we have central services. Do we have central services and DPW? Yeah. Okay. Rich is from the DPW and David's from the Central okay. Services. Okay, pardon me, that, that's simply my ignorance. And what was the other one that I'm missing? The planning department. Planning department, of course. So yeah, I guess I'm just um, a confused about the difference between, or what will be in the administration briefing? Is it just an opportunity for the mayor in general or the mayor's, you know, um, uh, so my, yeah. sure, I, I think I get your question. So um, 
my thought would be that central services in the planning department would go in that section with the DPW building department and Smith Volk. Uh, and, and the administration briefing, I really was uh, imagining that to be Wayne and Chris uh, and their time to bring subjects to the table. Like a more general report that, that maybe the time, exam for example, when we're going over those, those items uh, that are in our, the, the ongoing projects or? That was what I was thinking. Okay. Yeah, and then um, as far as the city council or commission or briefing, uh, I definitely want the opportunity and I'm sure Rachel or actually we have no idea who will be appointed to this commission uh, next term, but um, the I'm not sure we will have some 15 minutes or we'll have something that we want feedback on at every meeting. Um, I guess in that case that we would just skip that and have more time for the others. That would be what I would, I would think maybe as the um, as the agenda is being put together by Chris or Wayne, that they could send out an email to everybody and find out if there are subjects from each of these segments that people want to cover. And if there are, say, say there isn't anything that city council, city councilors want to discuss, that would give some extra time for somebody uh, from uh, the DPW or, or central services to speak uh, or we could hear from the tree tree commission. Or we, there's there's a lot of other other people that we could hear from. So maybe in instances where uh, one section doesn't have any anything to speak to in that meeting, that that time could be reallotted by whoever manages the agenda. Great. Um, uh, yeah. Thanks for that. Then my final question. Um, Maybe you could scroll down. Oh yeah, the guest subject matter expert, um, just that that may, uh, since we would be having a guest, may, may often be nearer to the beginning, just in terms of timing and, uh, you know, what they may not want to stay through the, have to sit through the rest of it. I think that's Thank a you. great, great suggestion. And, and yeah, just in general, um, I like the idea of trying things out for a few months, seeing how it goes and then revisiting. Yeah. Uh, Rich. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Alex was, uh, got the question I had answered. It was about uh, central services and uh, planning sustainability being part of the um, administration report uh, with the other uh, departments. So that, that was it. And thank you, Gordon. This looks, uh, this looks good. And again, I agree, I agree. Uh, with Alex, that trying something uh, for a period of time and seeing how it works, and then being able to tweak it um, if it doesn't work, or continue it if it does work, is is a great idea. Chris, yeah, um, uh, the one thing I would suggest adding is a section on new business. Um, I guess uh, Gordon, you were just saying that the um, the very big, the very first one you had. I can't. I don't. Can I scroll back up again a little bit there. Um, anyhow, just we need a, a place to, you know, stuff that we haven't talked about before. It's not a report back. It's not a status update. Um, uh, stuff that's new to be added. Sure. Is that something that uh, you're imagining uh, you and Wayne bringing to the table or just anybody? So the rules are they can't be substantive. I think that could be anybody. If they're not on the agenda already, they can't be substantive. They can be sort of last minute things that come up that you couldn't anticipate because otherwise we're violating uh, open meeting law. Um, Is so that, that typically, you know, something happens after no, the agenda. No, I, mean, I, I actually meant. Yeah, I actually meant it as a section. So that under that section would be agenda items that would be posted. Oh, got it. Okay. And. Gordon, to answer your question, I think that would be fine for anybody. I mean, that would be, you know, me and Wayne could set things up, but if any commissioner had an idea, um, you know, want to bring something up to the commission on new business, we put it on the agenda. Sure. So new business is not an item itself. It's, it's just a section. Sure. Okay. I want to come back to this in terms of timing, but Ashley first, and I, I can do my comments okay. after that. 
Sure. Um, yeah, I guess I would echo what others are saying. And I thank Sigourney for this. Um, in general, I I like the topics. Um, it strikes me as um, a lot to try to cover them all or even many of them in every meeting. I, I'm afraid that it might be like we might only get a, like a superficial like coverage of each one if we try to do all of them. In particular, I'm thinking about the um, section where we talk about like next steps. If we decide we're gonna be a little more action oriented in this meeting and, and decide we're gonna take on certain initiatives, like I could see us wanting to make more decisions, really move things forward in the meeting. So I could see times where we'd want a lot more than 15 minutes for like briefings on what we've done in the interim and, and where we're going next. Um, same thing with the commissioner, the rotating commissioner reports, the handful of times that we've done those, we've dedicated quite a bit of time to them. It's been, you know, a 15 or 20 minute presentation followed by like a, a, a decent amount of time for Q and A and discussion. So I think if Mr. is gonna put the time into like do a bunch of outside research to find some cool best practices or things that are happening and bring them to the commission. I'd want to make sure that we like really spend the time to thoroughly explore it and think about, oh, how could we apply that in Northampton? And then uh, similarly, when we bring in an outside speaker, totally agree with Echo um, Alex's point of moving it up in the agenda. Also seems if we're asking someone for their time and to come to a meeting that we sort of owe it to them to give them more than 15 minutes <laughs> and to make sure that they're not feeling super rushed to get through a presentation and that we then spend the time with them on Q&A. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll add my comments. I'll, I'll echo most of what people said. I think it's a generally good format. I have just, I guess, two concerns. One is sort of fits what Ashley said about the action oriented thing. Um, which is some things have clear timelines. So, you know, the, the last in the agenda today is the carbon sequestration calculations for conservation areas. That's grant driven. And so we're gonna be hiring somebody in January, whether the commission has time to discuss it or not. But I wanna make sure we hear from you because that's the whole point of the commission. So, you know, if we were doing just sort of rotating departments reporting out, something like that might be missed. And so I think it's worth doing agenda item very early on that is, you know, what are the things that are time critical so that we're bracketing them? Um, and then I guess related to both that and Ashley's comment about how much time for speakers, um, I, my suggestion is not to put times on the overall format and then leave it to Chris and I to figure it out. As we know, you know, yes, there's something from city councilors or there's not, or we have a speaker who's five minutes versus a speaker who's half an hour. Um, like I always remember when Ben was presenting the first time on a uh, heat utility, a uh, district heating utility, and we sort of had to cut them off because we're out of time. You know, and so I'd rather have those conversations up front and figure out what it is. So the agendas would still have the time um, and commissioners are certainly happy to say during a meeting, oh, I want to spend another five minutes on this. But it would give us flexibility to, to allocate the time based on what seems to come forward. Yeah, I, I certainly think that flexibility with the time is going to be critical. Uh, I put it in there as being fairly even to make sure that everyone was getting equal opportunity to speak. Uh, but I think that having it be at the discretion of the chair to make sure that um, things are being allotted, the amount of time that's necessary uh, would be useful. Uh, and both Ashley and Wayne, you, you guys said, uh, Ashley, you said next steps and, and Wayne, you said action oriented issues. Um, I think I was thinking of those as going down in the assignment of responsibilities. Uh, you know, assigning individual responsibilities should take three minutes. Um, so my thought, uh, I guess I, I was thinking that talking about what are next steps that we need to take on items and uh, that would go into the assignment of responsibilities time kind of oh, as a way of wrapping up our discussions during meetings to make sure that uh, we know what our next steps are and what actions we need to take. Um, so I guess the only question for that one, Gordon, I don't feel strongly, that was sort of what we used to have for our agenda. The last item I've got, what, what 
it was called. And then we started saying, well, maybe it's best to talk about them as we do each item. So do you want the last item to be, you know, three minutes, five minutes, whatever it is for assignment of responsibilities, or as we go through each item, do we want to include it as part of that? So, you know, the first one, action-oriented items, if it was this week, it might be, you know, uh, carbon sequestration. And maybe at the end we say, okay, you know, planning wants to be involved because we're spending money in Ashley because she's done all that work in carbon sequestration. So that at each item we, we summarize it. Thoughts yeah, I think that's, that? a, that's, a, that's a good point. I think maybe that would come down to whoever's taking notes for the meeting. If the person that's taking notes for the meeting is comfortable kind of recording uh, what is suggested, suggested as action item uh, during each of the sections and is then prepared at the end of the meeting to help remind us uh, what those steps are and, and help with the assigning of responsibilities. Yeah. And, uh, okay, that, that makes sense. Would work well. So, and again, I, and none of this is intended to be inflexible. Um, it's just uh, the outline as it as it seemed fitting, um, but certainly flexibility to address issues fully is important. Right, so generally we've been taking public comment on items we hadn't been during the retreat, but Adele raised her hand. I think we have a light enough agenda. I'm fine stopping for Adele. Is that any objective? Okay, Adele, you're up. I just wanted to comment that um, given the importance of the kinds of, of business um, that you're going to be addressing, uh, perhaps it's worth considering either having longer meetings um, or more frequent meetings rather than once a month, twice a month. Um, and that would alleviate some of the concerns being voiced right now. I certainly agree with that. There's so much that we need to accomplish and we really have a ticking clock. Um, if we're as a group going to achieve sustainability before we all burn, um, we're going to really need to put some effort into this. The only caution I'd have is if we have more meetings, we're going to lose. We have a really good attendance. I've been impressed with all you guys showing up. If it becomes longer, I just worry it's easier for people to sort of say, you know, I, I can't do it um, and can't take that level of commitment. So I'm think about it. Alex. I've really appreciated the times when we had uh, subcommittees um, for transportation, for waste, to, to, you know, when we were working on the, the CRRP uh, and the feedback there. And so having a more robust um, subcommittee system um, could allow for, you know, those who, who are able to, to take on that, the, the times in between, or sometimes to do, to do that. I know, I know for me, it's, uh, it would be a lot to add a second meeting every month. But if, if sometimes, you know, several times a year, I participated in a subcommittee in between, that feels more doable. I like that suggestion, Alex. Um, I had a lot of confusion with subcommittees and what was allowable. Um, we keep running into these open meeting issues and uh, as of yet, I'm really unclear as to what, you know, how to, how to stay uh, legal here and make sure that we're doing what we need to do to be notifying the public of what we're doing. And I felt like there were a lot of issues that should get extra time that would be well addressed by a subcommittee. But then I felt concerned about the open meeting laws issue. Um, so Gordon, the short version is there's no limit to number of subcommittees you can do. Each of them has to be advertised, duly advertised at least 48 hours ahead of time on the city clerk's board. And it takes her a little bit of time. So practically that might mean 78 hours ahead of time. And somebody has to take minutes that have to be adopted and recorded and made available. So as long as there's their postings and minutes, there's no limit. It's the, where, where we get in trouble with open meeting laws, the things that aren't posted, you know, three people meet for coffee and start chatting with things or someone calls up someone else. So a formal subcommittee structure is just fine. They could be ad hoc committees too. They just still need to be advertised. So 
it's not like you have a standing waste management committee. It's three of you are interested in talking about waste management, meet, just let Chris do an agenda and someone has to volunteer for the minutes. Yeah. Alex. Yeah, and it, just to clarify, my understanding on that is that it's for any item that we designate, we delegate, we say, will you work on this? And it involves more than one person. Um, if two, co two commissioners just want to chat about something, um, it's actually fine to chat about things as long as you don't reach quorum. Um, but if it's something that we've said that the committee has delegated, then it, even two is, uh, must, must be an open meeting. That, that's that, my understanding. And that's I exactly found it, right. 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 Yeah. I found it, it, it. I mean, the only hedge to that is, but even if it's self-delegated, you know, if there's two people chat over coffee and, and you, you <laughs> want to get to know someone to come back and it helps doing your thoughts, have a great time. Um, if you're sort of then coming back and saying, okay, you know, David and I met, here's our recommendation, then we've sort of, in essence, been self-delegated. But otherwise, you're absolutely right. Um, and obviously, the other thing which I think you all know is, and it can't be indirect, you know, Ashley and Alex can't meet, then Alex and David meet, and then David and Rich meet, you know, and have the same conversation. Um, but otherwise, yeah, Alex is correct. And I found it very, uh, you know, Chris has always been helpful in, uh, you know, getting those meetings posted. What subcommittees do we have right now? Yeah, happy to. I don't Chris, think we do have any at the moment, but I, I really like this idea of, you can't hear me? Now I can. I'll let someone else speak then. Okay. I don't think we have any subcommittees at the moment, but I see them being actually really valuable if we start going through the climate resilience regeneration plan. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Should we maybe set uh, something on next month's agenda about creating subcommittees? Because if we, uh, I was confused by what subcommittees existed and then I felt like there were some subcommittees that were created um, maybe at a meeting that I missed, but I never got assigned to any subcommittees. Um, so can we put that maybe on the agenda for the next meeting to form subcommittees? That's fine. And it, but again, think of it two ways. You don't forward. have to, it's on this agenda. It, I'm sorry? It, it's actually on this agenda. I mean, oh. if you look at the... Under new, under new business, the media focus select high impact projects who needs a subcommittee, you can form it today. All right, fantastic. All right, great. And, and Gordon, remember, there'd be two types that you could have a standing subcommittee that's always there, or you could just have an ad hoc committee that says, let's meet, you know, twice before the next meeting. And that's, we're coming back with a recommendation that we're done. I think you guys had a couple of those in the last year that they weren't permanent committees, but I think got, you know, Alex was on one with waste that they got with whom. Okay. All right. Are um, people comfortable with where we are? And Chris, since you're going to be writing this up, do you feel like you have enough direction? Do, uh, well, it's, it's just going to guide the way we It's just going to guide the way we do agendas. Yep. Yep. From now on, right? Which, yep. Quite frankly, I started started to use Gordon's suggestion to build this agenda. So I, mean, I think we're just going to take the feedback. It'll be in the minutes. You guys can look at it and make sure I got it all right. Um, uh, we'll take this feedback and we'll start to develop agendas based on this conversation. And as Alex said, try them. Readjust, you know, adjust them as needed um, as we go forward, uh, and we'll just see. We'll give it a try. Does that work, or do we need to actually have a written out formal piece more than what Gordon already has? No, I think that's good, Chris. I mean, other than the changes we made as we were going through it, because I think yeah, it's going to be a living document. Keeps changing. If we could, I would love it if we could make a motion since we're about to have a number of members move on uh, from city council. Um, if we could make them, I'd like to make a motion to adopt this agenda as revised during today's discussion. 
You, I, I hear that as a motion. Gordon, um, w before I second, would, would you, um, could we specify like for the next four months or something like that to give us a, our, our trial? Sure, I would make a motion to adopt the proposed agenda for a trial period of the next four months. Second that. Okay, any discussion before I go for a vote? All right, so again, roll call vote. Um, Louis? Um, yes. Uh, Alex? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Ashley? Yes. Rich? Yes. Uh, ben had to step out, so he's not here right now. He's going to join us again. Wayne, yes. David? Yes. Okay, unanimous. Great, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Gordon, do you want to um, read, do you want to edit it based on today's feedback or do you want me to do it based on the minutes? I can send you the notes that Chris, I was keeping track as we were going. So I can send you the marked up copy. Okay, so you're so Gordon, you're okay with us just kind of going with what we have down. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. All right, so next on is on the, the norms and expectations. Ashley, you may have to remind me, but I think this came from you originally a year and a half ago. Does that look familiar to you? <laughs> okay, since it you're is. not jumping up and down, do you remember this enough? Chris, yes, go ahead. Yes, this definitely is. I mean, this, yes. this, this was pulled right out of past minutes that mm -hmm. Ashley proposed. And I think, yeah, February 2020, right before the, um, right before the pandemic hit. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, this would have been our last in-person meeting. It doesn't say don't get. Yep, it COVID. was. <laughs> wow. Ashley, do you remember you enough didn't know of about this? It <laughs> Ashley, do you remember enough of this to sort of say why you, why this made sense, either specifics or just generalized introduction? I mean, I think the concept was, um, you know, knowing that we have a revolving membership between um, city councilors uh, moving in and out and others terming out, um, we just thought it would be useful and sort of best practice for a committee to have written down kind of sets of norms and expectations. Um, I would need to sort of refresh my memory <laughs> to go through any specific details of this, but it, it I mean, in general was speaking to kind of etiquette as well as like level of effort and kind of responsibilities that go along with being a commissioner. Okay, did anyone look at enough that they want to comment on it now? Do you want to Adopt it. Do you want to think about it more? What's your pleasure? Is there anything below that public? Is that the full sentence with public comment? Yeah, that's the full thing. I don't know. Was that cut off? Um, it seems like it. I don't know. Who yeah, was yeah, it, off, but I think it was cut doesn't off. seem like a complete thought. <laughs> Chris, what were you saying? Yeah, that got cut off somehow, actually, but it was a little document, and it, that's what it said, <laughs> as I recall. Oh, it was cut so off. We could, just, that's all we recorded in the minutes. Okay. I'm pretty sure I I wrote up a whole separate document. Um, so I can dig that up from my files and resend it. Cause I, I'm pretty sure that I presented and read out a document to the commission at this meeting. So you would did can we just put this off to our next meeting? So Ash can find the document and we we'll talk about it then. I think that probably makes the most sense. Okay. Um, we can, I'll send it to you and we can get it out to the commissioners. That'd be great. Thank you, Ashley. 
All right, so moving along, the, the next thing with membership needs, but frankly, I can't remember what this one's about. Could it be we our vacancy? Wayne, I think that you just yeah. had that listed. So whatever other You're talking about the kinds of I don't think um, so. What I kind think... of representation we want on the commission, whether it's increasing um, diversity or just different perspectives or skill sets. Um, okay, well, I'll just open it up for thoughts, comments. Gordon. Um, I remember discussing this a few meetings ago uh, and my desire being somebody who's involved in community outreach or somebody who, somebody who works with volunteers. Um, <clears throat> we had something in the uh, proposed mission statement saying, that we would try to engage the community more. Um, and I wonder if there's some way that we could work to find someone who does that professionally, um, who could join this commission and then tap us into a group of volunteers to do work on the ground. And Gordon, are you thinking of just making that recommendation to mayor when it's the next time this opening or having a specific by ordinance slotted position. Oh, I would just maybe suggest this is a recommendation to the okay. mayor that the mayor would seek somebody with community organizing background to okay. join the commission. That sounds good. Hey, Chris, can you fill me in? Do you know, do we have any vacancies right now? We do. How many? One. One, okay. I mean, tonight's the last city council meeting, so it's not going to be the current mayor, but we can certainly pass that on to the, the mayor elect as part of sort of briefing her on what the committee does. So. Right, to, to add on to what Gordon just said, the person, of course, who the vacancy is for is Aiden. And Aiden uh, is the one that managed, believe it or not, the Energy and Sustainability Commission has a Facebook page. Um, did anybody know that? <laughs> <laughs> You know, Aiden um, managed that. So having someone who um, who can help us manage social social media would be great. Yeah, that's good. All right. Well, that certainly fits in what Gordon was saying anyway. Community outreach question. So. Right. Anything else in this membership needs issue? I mean, obviously there's gonna be two council openings that maybe the existing councilors are not, but that's gonna be up to the council president. Um, and there's gonna be a central services director, but that's ex officio, so that will come in on that. So yeah, Alex. Yeah, I just wanted to let everyone know, I do plan, I do hope to remain on energy and sustainability, but uh, you know that will be up to the new city council president. Right, okay, good. Is there a battle among counselors? Don't tell me, I'm just joking. But I'm sort of curious, are there like some committees that people really want to get on? But you, you, got, you guys both bring a good passion to this. Um, okay, so let's go back to the, the non-retreat, the normal agenda. Um, administration's upcoming projects. The only things that I have are sort of the, the top the bottom two that are under new business. So I'm not gonna focus on that. Actually, I do want one other thing for so you all so, have us. Um, you know, we talked about, I told you at the last meeting that we now merged the climate resilience and regeneration plan into sustainable Northampton. The next step, we, you know, this grant that we have that's been paying for this process. The next step is to put out a, um, an updated dashboard. If any of you go to, designresilience.com, you see our designresiliency.com, you see the current dashboard that we have. That was sort of a free service from our consultant. That runs out uh, January 30th. So we've been thinking about the replacement and we've decided the route we're gonna go is hire someone to do a story map. Um, 
which is sort of a good way to have a graphic rich piece for the entire sustainable North Hampton of which resilience and regeneration is a portion. So we're currently, you know, reaching out to consultants to do that kind of work. Um, that work, the grant runs out June 30th. So that work has to be done by June 30th. We're hoping it'll get sooner. So that's my only current one other than the last two new items. Uh, Chris, do you have administration upcoming projects? Yeah, so what this is, the way I read this, the, the way I read this from Gordon's suggested um, uh, agenda was that, and the general sense of the commission was they didn't want to be caught by surprise if we were putting out an RFP or something like that. So I got the impression this is really trying to keep the commission updated. So I've got I've got a list of um, uh, you know shorter term firm projects and longer term potential projects that I could read through right now, and I'll, I could do that. I'm going to just suggest that perhaps we attach this kind of a list to the um, that table of recommended and follow up actions that we have. So there's a second. You, know, you can use the same workbook, a second worksheet. <clears throat> we just have this in there. And um, so, you know, a monthly, we're not going to update this monthly. It's, um, you know, we just don't generate that many projects that fast. Um, but maybe it's a quick update on where they stand and stuff. Um, so with that recommendation, um, I can go through what we have coming up, bids and stuff like that. So um, we don't really have any RFPs, requests for proposals coming up um, at the moment. We have invitations to bid um, for installing EV chargers on Crafts Avenue and Strong Avenue. That actually will be out next week. Um, uh, we will soon, we'll, sometime over this winter, we will have uh, an invitation to bid on air sealing and insulation leads uh, attic. Um, by the spring, there'll be an invitation to bid to rebuild the fire headquarters parking lot. The design's already done. It's going through some last um, planning um, adjustments and stuff. Uh, so that'll be out sometime in the sometime over the winter. Um, right now we're seeking quotes, which is kind of a lower level of procurement than bids um, for fenestration and window design for the old section of Leeds Elementary School. Um, we've mentioned this in the past, so this is going to be you know, we're going to be re redesigning the windows in Leeds Elementary School and getting a design on replacements. Um, some really low level procurement um, through the program expeditors program. This is uh, something that we're allowed to do with utilities. The senior center just occurred to us that the senior center's outside lights have never been turned into LEDs. They look like LEDs and it kind of faked me out, but if you look up into them, they're not LEDs. So um, we'll be looking at outside lighting at senior center. Um, then a couple of projects that got knocked off. Um, you may have heard of them a long time ago, but uh, COVID knocked them off because we couldn't get people into the schools. Freezer controls in the high school and the middle school and some weatherization work at JFK. We're trying to get re-incentivized um, to get those done. Um, but there's no real RFP or anything there. Um, Miscellaneous wise, um, there's a few more charger stations that are gonna be wrapped into the roundhouse redevelopments and wrapped into the fire headquarters parking lot redevelopment. I mean, roundhouse parking lot redevelopment and the fire headquarters redevelopment. Um, miscellaneous, you know, we're working with various city departments to get electric vehicles instead of um, internal combustion engines. And miscellaneous, as you know, we have PV arrays going on three of our schools. And then there's longer term potential projects. I'm gonna run through these because they might, some of these might be of interest to you. These are basically ones that are coming off the capital improvement plan. They haven't been approved yet. So we don't have money. We don't know if they're gonna be going forward or not. There's the Academy of Music, um, insulation and air sealing, um, the slate roof, the hatch up on top is going to be repaired. Uh, DPW, um, they are asking for the energy recovery ventilation and new windows. Uh, Florence Fire, we're asking for an expansion um, renovation study, so a study on how to expand that building. Memorial Hall and Municipal Building, both are going to have new roofs. 
I put it down here because it's just roofs, but neither one of them, the roof is not a thermal boundary for either one of them. So I don't think it really is gonna come up to play in here, but I'll mention it. Forge library, the lower level ventilation and some spaces being re, re, um, um, reconfigured. Again, I don't think the commission is gonna be interested in weighing in because they're including um, ERVs. David, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm pretty sure Forge library is including an energy recovery ventilation and the heat distribution system will be low temperature. So it will be lined up ready to go for, um, uh, for some kind of a heat pump in the future. That's uh, correct. Senior center, window repair. Okay, great, David, yeah. Uh, the senior center, window repair. The municipal building, this is a, a real problem for us. It's got a boiler that's really just clunking along. Um, it's a building that, you know, we don't want to put a new boiler into it, but we don't know what we're gonna do with that building yet, despite all our net zero studies, because it's a really crappy building. But we haven't got money for it. It's not a set project yet, but it's on the kind of long-term list. Um, schools, um, ongoing net zero studies, um, uh, the whole leads energy recovery plan and air source heat pumps, um, uh, you know, the construction of that will be um, coming up later on at the moment. We know that Jackson Street School has got kind of a similar situation. So we might be doing the same type of thing at Jackson Street School. Uh, there's ongoing energy management system upgrades going on in all of our schools that kind of we're slowly working through them. Um, that's been going on for a while and it's going to continue on. It's no, there's no um, uh, bidding needed because we've got a contractor that's got a phased approach to it. Uh, long term, uh, Bridge Street, uh, there, that's going to be the next boiler in the school that's going to be need to be replaced. Um, we're really hoping we're going to have a set plan in place before that comes up. It's, it's, that one's not urgent. Um, but it just, we kind of know coming down the road, that's going to be there. So there's your heads up on a lot of things that the city's looking at doing. Um, you know, if anybody's interested in diving into any of these in more detail and stuff, we can put them on a future agenda. Um, and if everybody likes the idea of putting this into a table so that you guys have access to it, <clears throat> we can just keep that list, um, try to keep that list current. I like idea. the idea of Chris doing it all in the same place. Uh, David. Yeah, just to uh, follow up on what Chris said, that was a good report, Chris. Um, so by February, early March, um, the finance director and the new mayor, uh, based on recommendations from the Capital Planning Committee, should issue a draft of proposed capital projects for fiscal 23 but there are five year spreadsheets that exist uh, that the commissioners might be interested in looking at as far as what projects we laid out for fiscal 23, which starts in July, going out to fiscal 27. And those projects move up and down the list every year as we redo another five years. So Chris, that could come up by the end of February and could be put into this table that you just talked about. Yep. Uh, Gordon. I was just going to say, uh, and also I agree, um, that was a really great comprehensive list. I appreciate that. I would love to see that go into a table just so that we can be looking at it uh, regularly. Um, I would be certainly interested. Boiler replacements are, are very expensive. So um, i at the very least, I think we would all be interested to hear uh, what options are weighed when examining those projects and what the different paybacks look like uh, on potentially switching over to heat pump system or something. Um, and uh, with the roof replacements, uh, certainly uh, would love to hear about how uh, design alternatives are weighed for new roofs uh, to allow for the installation of uh, solar panels. Um, I think that that would be very useful to know how we're looking at that. Thank you, Good. Uh, Ashley. Yeah, thanks for that, Chris. Um, in a separate communication a couple of weeks ago, um, we, there was brief mention of the um, fire station 
solar project. I was just wondering if you could update us on that. Yep. Um, yeah, actually, did I have that on my little notes to explain at this point? I was going to go, I was going to touch upon that at some point this meeting. So this is a great time. So the fire headquarter PV array and battery system um, and the microgrid that we were working on. The, I mean, the, the, the short story is the grants expired. Um, and the, the reason they expired um, is when, you know, for one of them, we had received um, a grant extension approval. We had signed it. We had sent it back. We had gotten notice. You're all good to go. And then when we actually, I think that might have been the microgrid one. When I when we got the designer and we were about to put pen pen to contract, um, kind of looked through the files and I realized I'd never had a signed contract back from the state. I had a verbal, I actually had an email that said you're good to go, but we never received a final signature. So I asked for that. And uh, at the same time, we were last asking for an extension at fire headquarters. After months, what we got back was a new contract and uh, something that says to void the old contract and to give us a new contract. And the new contract had stipulations in there that made it highly probable that we would um, commit to spending money and then reach a point where we would, you know, there was a good chance that we would commit to spending money, but we couldn't finish it by a deadline. And the terms they had in there had it down. It was really kind of complicated, but it was basically we couldn't talk to them. We couldn't ask them for an extension. The way it was put down, we had to, you know, check off A and B this before C and D could be done. And the logic just sat down and said, we're going to get ourselves in a situation where we're going to spend money and we won't be able to get this grant con get with this grant because we won't be allowed to talk to them. We won't be allowed to ask for an extension. And we brought this up over and over and over again. We went through our state reps. We went through our, our state senator. Uh, we went through um, people in the DOER. We went through the, you know, we, we tried to climb the ladder to the very top. And in the end, they didn't budge. Um, and it just felt fiscally irresponsible to try to move forward with it. And then on top of that, I'll say with the fire headquarters, the um, a PV array on um, uh, the ground and uh, um, above, above the parking lot with the battery system, uh, it was just also really complicated to do it because the state insisted that we own the batteries. It would be far easier if we could have had a PV array and a battery system owned by a third party. And um, uh, I won't, I mean, I just can't tell you the, the conniptions we were going through to find the, to find the needle hole to go through in order to get this project to work. The closest that we got, the pricing on it, um, it would have cost us money. It would not have been a savings. In other words, normally PV arrays and battery systems, you're going to expect to get a savings. So of course, for more resilience, we would have been worth doing that. And we probably would have gone ahead with that. But we would then have just been spending more for electricity than we currently are. But it was um, kind of a problematic project. But the piece that killed it was the fact that the Department of Energy Resources um, uh, added this contract language, added this language to the contract and wouldn't take it away. To make people feel any better, from what I know out there, most communities that got these contracts didn't finish their projects. And the one that I know of that did, did it in two pieces. The PV array went in first. They went back to the OER. They asked for a whole bunch more money because they couldn't do it with the money that they had really originally been given. They then added the battery system. And in order to do that, they had to tear out the old inverters. So they had to do it in two pieces in a very expensive way. In a way, this was really kind of a poorly structured grant to begin with. And, um, and in the end, with the fire parking lot being redesigned, it pushed us back. And we couldn't, in all good faith, go forward without putting the city at a higher level of risk than we normally would go for. It's a sad story. Any questions or comments on this? I'm just watching the time. 
Gordon. I guess I'd like to start by saying thank you so much, Chris, for going through all of that effort. I know how complicated those projects can get. Uh, that sounds atrocious. Um, I think that this is one of those areas where uh, we can write letters to the state and maybe we should all sign a letter, um, you know, letting, the, you know, whoever it is that we so choose know that we've gone through this and that it was a problem just for the record. Um, that we feel like it damaged the sustainability of our city. Um, and I just wanted to point out that I think a lot of the problems that are happening now with solar in Massachusetts go back to the absolute disastrous energy legislation that went through, I believe it was in 2018, where the legislature decided that they would rely on offshore wind instead of solar and they destroyed the entire SREC market and the solar industry almost collapsed uh, because of it. At least all large scale installations completely collapsed. Uh, and there are an enormous amount of projects that were planned uh, that fell apart because of the state's uh, actions and uh, those are the kinds of things that I would love to see us writing our legislators about and encouraging them to, to change or adopt new energy legislation. I'm sure Adele is on top of that kind of stuff. I'd be curious to hear what's potentially happening. But yeah. Anybody else before we go on? All right, I'm going to keep us going so we don't run out of time. Uh, that was really good. And Chris, I really love the idea of amending that tracking sheet to include new projects. That, then what's nice about that is if people have a chance to look at their agendas ahead of time. We can spend time and things that people have most questions about going forward. So the next three items aren't things that we're really doing now, but more we want to figure out, you know, if we're we're following the agenda items, what do you how do you want to start implementing? So the first one for rotating department heads. Um, you know, we obviously want to give people a heads up when they're going to be on. So do you want sort of, you know, we just go through the order each time and, and go around again? Do we want to see as de as department heads or representative comments? What, maybe I'll start with you, Gordon, because you're the one who suggested this, but what was your vision for that? A formal rotation or? Yeah, I was thinking a formal rotation so that uh, people would have plenty of time to prepare and know, you know, a couple months in advance that uh, that they're going to have an opportunity to take some time and kind of brief us on what they're doing uh, in the vein of sustainability and energy conservation. Um, so, yeah, I, I would like for people to be able to prepare and plan and and kind of make a list as time passes of the things that they'd like to talk about to to bring up. Okay. And obviously we can't compel department heads not in the committee to come. So the question is like, can Rich represent DPW? I mean, or, you know, or ask Donna if she want if she wants to come, but I'm it would love to it, it would be wonderful to have Donna, uh, but Rich has lots of interesting things to say. And so I'd love to hear from Rich. Yep. Yeah. Um and so yeah, uh, if the representative wants to speak or they want to come and it gives them a good excuse to come every few months, that would be great. Okay, so we can start with, I mean, we don't need to know specific departments unless there's someone you wanna hear from next month. We can just sort of email all the departments, you know, Rich and Donna, you know, sort of say we're planning on doing this and, um, you know, are, are you willing to take part in which meeting makes sense for you? Any other thoughts on that one? Do we want to pick one for next month, or we we just select that after talking to different department heads? I guess that makes more sense. Yeah, let's reach out and then and then we can come back. So Chris, you and I can, can coordinate on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So the commissioner's report. I guess the first thing is: Does do any commissioners have any reports to make back? And then the second part of this, likewise, do we do a formal rotation, or is people just raise their hand at each meeting? I'll start with, do commissioners, are there any commissioners who want to report? 
Is the idea of this report to be um, reporting on, I mean, going forward, reporting on sort of work we've done between meetings or is it an assignment to kind of go out, do some research into what other kind of peer groups are doing across the country and kind of propose a topic to present to our, to the commission? I would think it's either one, but I'll leave it to you all. So Gordon's nodding his head, both. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think that, that it could be open to, to whatever uh, any of us would like to speak to. Uh, certainly looking at the, uh, the CRRP and maybe picking a topic out of there that we want to discuss and then bringing that uh, to the group. Um, and maybe that would be a good way for all of us to be choosing our discussion topics would be to look at the resilience and regeneration plan and pick a spot where where we would like to turn everyone's focus for 15 minutes and just kind of uh, shepherding along the discussion. So at each meeting, should we just say who wants to report at the next meeting? Just so we it helps us figure out the agenda and helps you get ready. Does that make sense? Yeah, we. Yeah, yeah, maybe in the same way that you'd reach out to department heads, reach out to the appointed commissioners and, okay. and see, if, see if someone has a specific topic. Or, but we could also make it a rotating thing to make sure that everyone gets a chance. My, my original vision was that it would be rotating uh, so that everyone would know a few months in advance that they're going to have a slot and they could pick something out and prepare. And, okay. And Does that work for everyone? Does everyone come for that? Should we rotate by alphabetical order of last names? Yeah, and remember the universe is small because those of us who work for the city are gonna be reporting as part of the department report outs and those who are elected are gonna be reporting as part of the elected officials. So it's, my math isn't very good, but you know, right. between you here and the people who aren't here, what's the four members who are, whatever the number is, but. Yeah, it would be four members when the commission is full. Right now, it's only three. Yeah, OK. All right, so let's just do it alphabetical. And you always reserve the right to pass when you want. But it'd be nice to let us know that. So we can you know, we can do a schedule. If you, so if you're not going to be at the meeting or you don't have anything, you can know as we can let the next person on the list go for it. Um, all right, and then so the last one, the list, same thing. We obviously don't have a guest subject matter expert today. But does I anybody? Guess. Yeah, I've got some suggestions, Wayne. Okay, go for it. Okay. Um, uh, so um, I've been reaching out since Eversource has taken over Columbia Gas. Um, I was reaching out just to get a contact there. And that led me to looking into asking both them and my energy efficiency rep at National Grid. And I've asked both of them if they could give a presentation on Mass Save to the commission. They'd be both be very happy to. They suggest February um, because the latest three-year plans are kicking off in January and they don't quite know what they're doing, yet they think they'll, they'll be in a better shape to actually give us more accurate information uh, in February. So I suggest that as a possibility. Um, another one I'm looking up in, as I was doing this research, I came across a news release um, that had to do with the, um, what, what was the name of the town where the gas explosions happened last year? Lawrence. And, um, what's that? Lawrence. You said Lawrence. Lawrence? Oh, Lawrence. With an L. Okay, Lawrence. It was Lawrence, okay. <laughs> mostly Lawrence, some North Andover, and a bit of Andover. Okay, so the, um, I didn't know this, but in the the settlement for that whole thing, the, 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 what the settlement did was it basically kicked Columbia Gas out of Massachusetts. I thought it was Eversource, but it, it wasn't. Columbia Gas got kicked out of Massachusetts. Eversource took over. And as part of the um, settlement, uh, Eversource has to, uh, actually, actually, actually what it boils down to is Eversource has to pay Department of Energy Resources a half a million dollars in order to do a Northampton heat pump pilot. Here you go. Struck my, that caught my ear. What is a Northampton heat pump pilot? What it basically is, is it's the Northampton, it's not so much the city of Northampton, I don't believe. I haven't talked to someone at the OER yet, 
I've, I've left them me several messages, but it's the uh, Northampton pipe extension. Um, um, so it's it's because that that extension is so packed that we are in a moratorium. So I'm pretty sure it's for all of you, anybody who's in that moratorium. There's going to be a heat pump pilot of some kind. So once I find the DOER person and I can talk to them, I'd love to have them come and talk to the commission. That's another one we could have. Um, um, I think it'd be really informative to have an expert come in on photovoltaic incentives. Um, you know, the program is constantly uh, changing as Gordon kind of lead, alluded to. It was um, really diminished in effectiveness a number of years ago. So where does it stand? Where does it help for us and stuff like that? So that's another one. And then the last one, um, I uh, was it, it was for some reason the utilities put out um, individual in, um, invitations. They, these were invitations you couldn't share with anybody else. But I was on a webinar today on the future of gas, uh, and I've asked the presenters there, EverSource and National Grid if they'd be willing to come up, you know, to present to the commissioners. And they found that to be an interesting idea because at the moment they're going through a feedback period. See, I have some notes here. Um, and if you want more information on this, look at the future of gas dot, oh my, what is that? Probably dot com. I'll send out, a, I'll send out a link. Um, they did mention in there that DPU has approved pilots for the kind of heat studies, the pilot, you know, the, the what they call networked geothermal. And this is the kind of thing they're talking about. They're talking about geothermal, network geothermal, air source heat pumps, um, biogas, um, you know, and some other kind of renewable sources. Uh, but they're, they've been tasked with finding out what do we do with gas infrastructure between now and 2050? Uh, and how do we basically stop using, you know, how do, how do we stop, how do we get to net zero carbon emissions? Um, so that really does open up a lot in the conversation. They're looking for input at the moment. So if you're interested, I could tr try to bring them in and have them present to us. Um, they like the idea of talking to commissions because then maybe they, we, they could, and actually what they said was they're going to take that idea back to their bosses and I should reach out to them um, uh, down the road. So those are my ideas. And I'd love to hear any ideas that the commission has on who we might invite. And then I'd love to hear some priorities on what we, who we'd like to hear from. Ashley. Yeah, um, that's a good list, Chris. I want to react to a couple of things you said more just as, a, as an FYI, not, not as an instead of, but. Um, yeah, it, it's CET, we're very steeped in the mass save plan and we administer both commercial and residential mass save. So um, I'm also, I think we should hear it from the utilities themselves. It'd be interesting to hear how they present the next three year plan, but just as an FYI, I'm also um, very immersed in what the new incentives will be and the kind of new priorities for the three year plan. Similarly, we're closely tracking the, um, the various programs that are coming out of the um, Eversource Columbia Gas Settlement. Um, and so there, yeah, there will be this big heat pump program that's in all the moratorium areas, Northampton, East Hampton in particular. Um, it sounds like from our conversations with the DOER, it sounds like Mass CEC may ultimately administer that program. Um, we've been talking to Maggie McCurry, McCurry at DOER and again, I can, I can keep the commission informed if, if and when that, that gets released. Um, I know they plan to do it many, many months ago. Um, other ideas I have, I think it would be cool to um, bring in some people like peer groups. Um, so for example, like came, the city of Cambridge's, I don't know if it's a commission that officially reports to the city, but they have a very active citizen group working on kind of pushing 
um, legislation and sort of city decarbonization. I think Belmont is another town that's doing some cool stuff, I mean, across Massachusetts. So I think it would be neat to bring in some representatives from other groups that are sort of on the leading edge of pushing city and town level initiatives and to kind of learn from them. Um, likewise, around here, it might be nice to be interacting a bit more with our immediate neighbors. So Amherst has an equivalent of NESC. Um, so to bring them in to hear what they're working on and to see if there are ways that we can collaborate, um, especially since we're working with them on the CCA. Um, it might be kind of neat to see if there would be some synergistic work with the commissions. So two things that follow up nice. to Ashley. Ashley, I, I don't um, Yeah, Chris? Wayne? Sorry, I jumped Chris, in there because I didn't have a... I, I was just going to say, Ashley, do you want to present? Uh, do you want to be the commissioner to start next next month and give us a rundown of what CET is doing on commissioner reports? I'd be happy to do that. You can say no, too. No, I'm, yeah, <laughs> okay. I'm to totally happy. It, yeah. It, it, um, yeah, let's uh, let me think about what what might be most useful, and we can. Um, yeah, let's be in touch about that. I I'm happy to say yes. I actually have one follow up question before I go to Alex. But so you're just talking about talking to CEC. They're going through this whole decarbonization pathways program. Are you have you guys worked with them? Is that something you could include in your Presentation, are you familiar we, with we work a lot with um, Mass EC. We have funding from them right now. For example, um, we're doing this um, feasibility study for tariff on bill financing um, for the town of Ipswich. And yeah, we've had lots of funding with them and, and we're, we're sort of aware of this decarbonization okay. pathways. The reason I'm curious is they had their own um, rebates for heat pumps, uh, mm -hmm. ground source heat pumps separate from Mass Save. Yep. And then they seem like we don't want to go forward in this. We want to be a more comprehensive look. And so that the decarbonization pathway is exciting, but I have no idea where it's going. So if you know anything, that'd be great. Um, sure. Yeah, I could try to get an update on um, where that stands for the presentation. Okay. Great. I think the main goal of their other um, heat pump pilot was to provide incentives to gas customers who weren't eligible for them under mass save. What we're hearing and nothing set in stone yet is that it, from the start of the next three year plan, um, incentives will be available to gas customers to transition to heat pumps. Yeah, yeah. they have interesting programs and we applied for a grant to, to support um, e-bike adoption for low and moderate income neighborhoods. And so they clearly seen that as a way to get people out of single occupancy vehicles into other transportation. So they do seem to be playing around in different non-traditional ways. For that. So, um, Alex, you're up. I love uh, all those ideas. Thanks, Chris and Ashley. Um, I thought on a different vein, um, land use. And um, so, you know, I think the planning department has a lot of expertise in this area, but is there anyone that we can bring in uh, to help us think further about that or, or different examples, especially, uh, you know, as we work on uh, advocating for infill and looking at the pushbacks and how, how can we address work to address those pushbacks. Um, and then transport uh, folks that uh, have, worked on public transit and, and kind of the, the one of the problems of um, the, <clears throat> not sure, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the difficulty for some to adopt uh, the use of public transit part because of kind of the stigma that it has in some cases and, you know, what kind of public campaigns or approaches of other small cities done that, that may have been successful. So I don't know who to ask for, but those are some ideas. That's great. Other thoughts from anybody? Uh, I just, I think I like all those, uh, everyone's thoughts. Um, I just want to share um, 
this commission obviously has been around a lot longer than the Urban Forestry Commission, but what we found successful to help the Urban Forestry Commission kind of get off the ground was doing exactly what um, um, Ashley and, and Alex have said was really to reach out to other communities or other people that have uh, similar uh, populations that have similar tree commissions or um, have uh, similar uh, interests or similar citizens groups. I mean, we, we relied heavily upon Amherst when we were starting the Urban Forestry Commission and modeled after their commission. But since then we've reached out to um, other commissions. We've also reached out to state officials, for example, at uh, DCR, uh, Department of Conservation and Recreation. They have an urban forestry, um, uh, community forestry uh, grant uh, application system that we follow. And Julie Coop is there. She just came to our last meeting. So we try to have like one guest speaker at, uh, we meet twice a month. So we have one, try to have one guest speaker once a month for a time slot. So, but I think it's really important because I think there's a lot of people that are in our position all over the Commonwealth that are trying to do the same thing and trying to really um, make things more sustainable and try to meet those goals. And they're all running up against the same kind of difficulties we are. So I think it's great to network. I think that's really important. All right, this is great. I think we can have enough speakers the next two years. So. Um, <laughs> I want to keep us on time. I am going to ask just to switch the order of the two new business items because I'm not sure how much discussion we have about carbon sequestration. So I want to do that because I don't know if it's going to be five or 10 or 15 minutes and then the um, high impact practices is less timely so we can start on that. So the carbon sequestration, this is the, the grant that I mentioned before. Um, we know we want to look at um, carbon you know, in conservation areas and DPW watershed lands just within the city and the corporate limits, but in particular, we want to think about sort of different management practices, right? So, you know, we're not, we're not, we had this conversation already when Ashley did her work, we're not claiming credit for what we're doing anyway. You know, the trees that exist that are sustainably harvest on watershed lands, we have them anyway, but is, do, you, do we want to think about being less aggressive and harvesting them? Do we want to think about other management practices. So this would both help us figure out how much carbon are we sequestering and, and how do we go forward. We've been reaching out for consultants. And unfortunately, it seems like there's two levels. This is sort of the question if anybody has expertise or thoughts. There is sort of, you know, I open up a textbook and say, you know, we're growing this many trees per, you know, tons of carbon dioxide per year, period. And then there's investment grade for people who are actually trying to sell their carbon credits, which we're not doing. Um, but the, I was hoping is to be something in between. You know, we, we flew LIDAR six years ago or so, so we can get detailed, you know, in theory of LIDAR, you can measure every single tree in the city. Um, so we're sort of looking in between, we've been exploring some consultants who do this work. And again, hearing that feedback of that middle ground. But so I guess the question for you is first, do people know specific consultants who would be useful? And second, um, are there specific things that would help the commission's work that you'd be looking for out of this? Gordon. I guess I'm a little bit confused. It says protected open space and carbon sequestration. And carbon sequestration, if it's growing trees, doesn't that become non-open space fairly quickly? Um, you know, uh, are we talking about mowing it or, or not mowing it? So, um, so DPW you have a field and you leave it open to to grow into trees and sequester carbon, then it's no longer open space. So, open space. The, the way we're defining open space is this is land that's not developed. It's not about openness and not having trees. Oh, okay. So it's all the conservation areas. So some of it, you know, the sawmill hills and mineral hills, we basically do benign neglect. We, the trees grow and we try to deal with, you know, invasive plants that are going to kill the trees. DPW tends to be more aggressive about harvesting the, the timber. Um, you know, so you can imagine a different pattern. We have both a golf course and pine barrens. We have some management decisions to make. Um, it's both trees. It's also soil. We know that there's, at least in our climate, there's more carbon sequestered in soil than there is in trees. So we think about you know, patterns of wetlands restoration that would store carbon. So those are the kind of things we're looking at, management decisions that are out there. Okay. Ben. Um, so 
if we know that we're not going to be trying to get, you know, to do accounting and have credits that can go on to a market, if that's not going to be part of this, then, you know, I, I question the value of even hiring a consultant to help you maximize this thing that you're only kind of keeping track of just cause. Um, and it seems to me that a, a be, or, or a, an important thing to actually focus on is what are the policies that the city can do that we know will increase carbon sequestration or that when we're making decisions, we should ask the question, will this uh, release a bunch of carbon or sequester a bunch of carbon? And the actual accounting for it is not so much as important as, as the kind of the direction. Um, and the thing that came to mind for me was uh, when uh, it, a few meetings ago, uh, there was discussion about uh, preserving farmland as against um, uh, pl placement of, of photovoltaics. And there was a kind of a heated discussion around that. Um, to, and it seems to me like that's a good example of to the degree that the city has some input you know, whether it's about, you know, zoning or, or, you know, whatever it is that we have some input, being able to say, well, not every crop, not every farming practice is, provides a benefit to somebody other than the farmer who sells his crop for a profit, right? And to the degree that we've got some reason to have a say in it, maybe having a policy that says, well, if your practices are going to enhance soil carbon, um, that, you know, or, or you're providing uh, bioswales and other sorts of uh, the, uh, storm surge and flooding uh, mitigation, you're providing a service to the greater society when you manage that portion of land that way. Um, and so the same thing with, with carbon, if you know, if you've doing practices that enhance soil carbon, we, we like it so much. If you're just Honestly, I don't care how great a farmer of potatoes you are. If you're doing conventional potato farming, you're releasing a whole lot of carbon every single time you till. Um, so I don't know. That's that's a thought is about so directionality. I, I, I think it's a good point. I don't think it's an either or. So the State Division of Conservation Services has a major study going on. They finished the first phase. That's about how do we build up our soil carbon. So a lot of those policy assessments, I think the state is working on. And they're not necessarily that different. So you're absolutely right. We need to understand those, but I think the state is going to be advancing that piece. I, I think the tension that I have from this is on the one hand, we all agreed it's not a top priority for us to do update our greenhouse gas emissions inventory, because frankly, we know it's not that useful and makes a lot of assumptions we want to invest in other things. On the other hand, we just talked about our mission statement and part of our mission statement is accountability. So if we're on target to say, we wanna be carbon neutral for city in 2030 and for the community in 2050, we need to start collecting the numbers on what does that actually mean? Um, and what comes out of some of those things is some policy decisions. So at least for open space, you know, how aggressively do we log the property? How aggressively do we store wetlands? Um, we wanna do those that are not just the generic things the state's doing but are specific for us that help us figure out how should we manage this differently. Because, you know, again, remember the city is protecting about 20%, 25% of the city is permanently protected open space, of which about 80% um, uh, of that is city owned. So, so those specific management decisions do come up there. Uh, Gordon. Um, I think what would be really helpful for me to understand would be like land types that are under our management. So uh, whether it be open field or forest or wetland, there are different management practices for each of those uh, types of land that we have. Certainly forest, I think we can all agree we would want to remain forest to sequester carbon. Wetland restoration should absolutely be done, uh, uh, you know, but if there's open fields that are being mowed regularly, then those are really not sequestering a significant amount of carbon and would be really good opportunities for uh, solar PV with a mix of pollinator habitat 
so that we can be working on providing clean energy to residents while feeding the pollinators and ensuring sustainability in that way. And so having like an inventory of how much acreage of each type of land we have, I think would be of great value to all of us in planning where we can uh, allocate uh, different management types for different yeah. types. Of yeah. And that's a, you all know, this, it, it mostly exists a few years out of the date that the Commonwealth has done a statewide land use inventory that we can convert into that. So we can overlay open space, overlay the Commonwealth's piece in open space. So that's a pretty simple analysis to do. Harder would be, you know, the different composition of forests, for example, you know. Um, but, that would be an interesting survey for us to do, uh, you know, I would love to go out with Rich sometime and take a look at the different types of forest we have and figure out what generation of growth are in them to help to determine the, the value of them for carbon sequestration. Yep, yep. First, first generation growth forest, first fourth generation growth forest, I think are of different values for that. And, and then we can be figuring out how much energy production and we start balancing all of these things. Well, that's one of the questions we're asking people who do remote sensing who use LIDAR data. So LIDAR is basically plane flies overhead and sends thousands of little, you know, uh, laser beams down and gets the reflection sort of think of, of radar with lights. Um, so we have a lot of our lands, we've done forest stewardship plans where we have detailed pieces of what the, the kind of timber growth is there. But if we're doing, you know, three or 4,000 acres, we're trying to figure out, is there a way to do it all quickly? Yeah. Well, that would be really interesting to see. Yeah. Other thoughts in this area? Does Northampton have any peat bogs? We have one, uh, Burt's Bog. Burt's Bog was mined for the state hospital. So the ponds at Burt's Bog were taken out for the state hospital, but the rest of the area is peat. But that's the only one we really have. I ask because they're, they're supposed to be just enormous carbon capturers. So. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so thank you very much. That's very helpful. So the, the time that we have left, we want to start this. Obviously, we're not going to finish, but start that whole high impact practices. What are the things beyond what the city is already doing that you identify, whether it's from the climate resilience and regeneration plan or other things we want to focus on? Um, the only person who emailed us in was Alex. I think that his stuff was included in the package. Um, no, I don't believe it was. Oh, it wasn't. Okay. Yeah, it, was, it was after the package went out. Oh, got it. Okay. So we can, we can share this with you all. Um, Alex sent this email. Um, uh, Alex, you want to start us just because you're the one who did your homework and, and walk this through your thoughts about this? Sure. Um, so the first part uh, just just looks at the importance of buildings. I think I, I don't go into any detail about what we can do, but um, <clears throat> the that and I think that's something we're all in agreement with. Um, so the second zoning and advocating for building code changes. Um, that's something that the city council is looking at in terms of expanding our fossil fuel free requirement uh, to more more buildings, but looking at what how we can do with incentives uh, rather than mandates certainly seems like uh, a, a good a good place to look. Um, uh, land use and its effect on transport. So I talked just before a little about infill and and kind of the pushbacks and how we can address those. Um, and then the the uh, use, you know, the, it's my opinion that we haven't been to, been allocating enough resources to sidewalks, to traffic calming, um, and public transit uh, accommodation. Um, and so, um, I think that you know that 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 there there may be more resources coming um, with our new mayor in those areas, as I know she's advocated for that in the past. Uh, but you know how how can we? Um, <clears throat> How can we move move that forward and encourage that? And what direction should we encourage that? What are the priorities? Uh, so, in terms of you know connecting people to from their residences to the commer their commercial needs, um, 
should we push for expanding mixed use areas uh, and existing residential areas? Always a politically difficult thing to do. Um, or is that uh, a lost cause at this point because of the, the market for commercial and, and how people use that? Um, so thinking about how to expand that access uh, between our mixed use areas and, uh, and our commercial areas and our existing residential areas, especially by foot, bike and, and public transit. Um, and then uh, the idea of, you know, do we change any of our zoning to uh, allow for smaller buildings on smaller lots than are now allowed um, to try to get more of the, of the, <clears throat> of smaller buildings that, that are net zero or, or very efficient um, and possibly cost less uh, because you're having, uh, you have a smaller lot and lot size is determining a, a lot about um, what the final cost is. And then um, the, from this last bullet, I'd say, you know, with this concept of induced demand, the understanding that if you have less uh if that if you have increased congestion it it will reduce demand because people plan trips better it works a lot better when you actually have an alternative to single uh, occupancy passenger vehicles uh such as public transit or biking or walking um so that's uh trying to plan to understand that that we're probably going to see increasing congestion and that people will change their plans and how can we work with that uh, to, to be as efficient and, and carbon redu reducing as possible. That's a great list. I just wanna give one example of the last one so you all know exactly how this comes up. We have to do projections. We have to model the traffic flow through downtown as part of the Picture Main Street project. Um, and one of the questions is, do we model it based on the current traffic volume or do we assume a 10% or 20% reduction in traffic because we're making it easier for bikes and pedestrians and to a lesser extent buses. Um, and that, that has a big effect on where we're reporting out what's the level of service through downtown. So that's a, you know, it's a very relevant piece for that. Um, Chris, your hand's raised. Chris, are you there? You're muted. Thank, thank you, yeah, I'm muting there. <laughs> So I'm, I'm trying to think of how the, the commission can you know, select from these things and then you know, identify ones they wanna work on and move forward and keep track of the ones they're not working on. Um, and I know that you know, the climate resilience resource and re, you know, the, the CRRP plan has got a really wonderful list of action items. I'm not sure what that was called, you know, energy 1A, energy 1B, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, yeah, I think I would find it really helpful to have, you know, a whole table of that. Um, uh, and then somewhere where we can kind of keep track of it and, get, and just actually go through that table, go through like what Alex has pulled out right here, you know, break this down into different action items that we can look at and just go through that one at a time and decide this is something that, you know, great, it's a good idea, but we're not going to be involved with it. Great. Or this, you know, this is something where maybe we need to do some research. So we need to we understand more, uh, and kind of in an organized way, go through um, all of the great ideas that we already have, and figure out which ones can we, which ones can commission um, when they put we put our shoulder to the wheel. Are we going to get the most bang for the buck out of? Um, and, and I'd love to do it in that kind of an organized way. So I'm going to just throw that out there as an idea. Well, and, and one thing Another I'll table add, we could have in our Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, and one thing I'll add is right off the top, there's a lot of, I mean, other than the buildings item, each one of these things planning is doing some work in these areas. And so I think I'll spread, I'll, I'll expand that spreadsheet we have of things that we're doing to include the areas in this. So that will help hopefully identify both what's being done and more significantly, what are the gaps and what's not being done. That might be fun. Uh, ben. So yeah, the, the table's not in the table's not in plan anymore. Go ahead. Sorry. 
so it, normally <laughs> I would be exactly with Chris on this. It's like, oh, let's let let's get ourselves a list and just kind of you know check through things. But in this case, I actually look at that last bullet point of Alex's and I say maybe this is a place where we need to think about how do we have high impact? It's where there are synergies between action items and where it's important for us to kind of have a large scale view of how things work together so that we can start recommending policies that will make them work better. So for instance, the density of buildings, right? That there's a density effect that makes transit work better. There's a accessibility by, by bike path that makes, uh, that, that makes uh, housing work better for people to just decide not, they, they don't even need to own a car or that, or that they can do most of their transportation by bikes. So actually kind of looking at these things together in some ways bef before saying, oh, we wanna advocate for this, this one particular action. Um, I think that it, it might be a good role for this, this group. Um, just, it, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I, I just look at all of these and I see how they interact and how not, not focusing on, uh, you know, you, not thinking about them as a package can cause them to fail. Uh, Ashley. Yeah, so where my head went with this exercise was, um, was think, to think about areas that we could be working where the city is not already focused. And we talked about this a little bit at the last meeting, but um, thinking about it, like, how do we help the city be in a little bit more control of its destiny in terms of the goals that, that you sit, you've, you've set. Um, so I think buildings for sure kind of bubbles to the top and then thinking about how, what can we do to really push decarbonization and electrification of commercial multifamily and residential buildings. And I like the idea of the commission carving out very specific um, projects or campaigns or initiatives that we take on. So for example, um, in the building space, one thing that has come up over the years are energy um, is energy disclosure. And you know, working as a commission saying, okay, as a commission, we are gonna make this happen in Northampton. So that means we need a policy. It means we need a, an IS platform. It need, you know, we need to decide, okay, what, what size buildings is this going to apply to? There are towns across Massachusetts and across the country that have these. I feel like it's a place where we're getting behind. Um, and that would be something that we could just like carve out and chunk up and do. I think another area where we could be effective that we have talked about in the past is in just communications and public outreach. We said most people in the city don't even know this commission exists. Um, so establishing more of a presence and being a trusted voice. I think there's a lot of mistrust of the Mass Save program, for example. So instead of hearing from their utility via a bill insert, all the great incentives available. Maybe they hear it from a, a, a group in their community that's kind of pointing them to the different opportunities and ways that they can decarbonize their home. You know, maybe we have a campaign around um, prioritizing how you could go about a stepwise approach to, to decarbonizing your home, like start with weatherization and then like going through different mechanism and pointing them to to the resources available. Um, I think schools would be another sort of entity that we could work directly with tackling both like energy. I know the city's already doing some of that, but maybe the waste side of things that are in the plan, um, helping them set up, um, you know, food waste donation and composting programs if they're not already in place. Example. That's great. So I think with that, Ashley gets the last word. I think this we need to come back to for the next agenda. So sort of keep thinking through this, both sort of the gaps and the areas where you can support other things. Um, this is David's last meeting with us. Although David, there is a, a community membership, community position open, but otherwise it's your last thing. So thank you 
both for this commission and obviously all the work you've done for the last however many years it's been. Thanks, Wayne, and, and thanks everybody. Um, yeah, it's been a good 15 year run with the city and um, my plans, they're a little nebulous at this point, but my plans are going to be to continue my work in climate resilience area. So who knows, I may come back as a guest speaker to a meeting. <laughs> That'd be great, you're welcome thank anytime. You. Uh, thank you, David. Yeah, thank you, David. All the best. Thanks guys. All right, thank you all. And I will see you, I see two hands. We are, oh, you're just clapping. Is that what hands are? As opposed to raising your hand? All right, thanks. <laughs> all right, thank you all.